Can you imagine sitting on a train going to Durham for the day to go for a scone? That's a very long train journey to be turning over in your mind. What am I going to do if I get there and there's no scone? The stress of walking into the tea room and that whole like, are there scones? Are there scones? Are there scones? Okay, there are scones. There are scones. Are they definitely fruit Why? scones? Yeah, it was it was a very stressful situation. The anxiety is real. Sarah Merker wanted to get the most from her National Trust membership and also remember as much as she could about every place she visited. So she set herself the challenge to eat a scone or scone in every National Trust place that sold one. And to hold herself accountable, she set up a blog and posted reviews of each site and every scone or scone she ate. I was going with the purpose of finding the great story. You know, I was looking for the nugget. I was looking for the thing that I knew my, my blog readers would go, wow, that's incredible. In total, she visited 244 National Trust places on an adventure that spanned three countries across 10 years. And as a result, Sarah has now become a real life encyclopedia of all the wonders and stories that are held within National Trust properties. You imagine like the house that's been there for centuries and centuries. It's seen so much going on in it. And the National Trust as a charity is keeping the doors open of that place. It's preserving it from Death Watch Beetle or whatever else, all the different things that could be attacking that building and causing it to be pulled down, right? In this conversation, we talk about what it took to visit so many places spread far and wide across the UK, whether it ever became a chore, how an army of internet followers helped Sarah in her journey. We talk about loss and grief and tackle the all important topic, whether it's best to put the jam on first or the cream. So there is a third, there's always a third way, right? There's always a third way. Mm, okay. And it's the same with jam and cream. So you'll have a gentle debate with people about whether it's cream first, jam first, and somebody would invariably say, that's all coming up in episode 10 of Great British Adventures. Before we started this conversation, you came to me with doubts of why I was even asking you and inviting you to come and talk about your story. Why was that? Well, I'd listened to a few of the uh, previous podcasts you'd done, Tom, and you know the people you've spoken to are incredible people, like who've done incredible things. Um, and I suppose my my experience has been incredible on a personal level, um, but it hasn't necessarily, you know, inspired other people. Maybe it has, I don't know. But um, it's a different kind of project. I've learned a lot from it. I hope it's given other people some pleasure. Um, but yeah, it's a different, it's very different to what you've done before. Well, I think, well, that's crucially why I've got you on because, um, first of all, I think your st story is definitely worth the conversation. Uh, I think the comparison to others is, is never great for your own self-worth, but on its own, your story is an, a fantastic, great British adventure fundamentally, which is why I've got you on. I think adventure comes in different forms. You don't have to. Uh, across a country, you don't have to champion uh, voices of those who don't have one. Sometimes it's just about challenging yourself and doing something which gets you out the door, which is what you've done. Some adventures take place over a day, some over a week, others span months. Yours is a journey of 10 years. How did it all start? Yeah, 10 years was a long time. So I started in 2013. August 2013, um, my husband and I had joined the National Trust earlier in the year. Um, we started at Chartwell, we went there on a day out, we joined up, um, decided it was better to join than to just visit one individual property, you know, a bit of a bargain to join. And then we didn't go anywhere. We literally then for months just didn't follow up with any other visits. And I thought, I'm not using this membership, this isn't great. Um, and then we went somewhere and I went and I had a look around and I came out and I just forgotten about it. And I thought, I need to, I need to remember this. This is important. This is an opportunity to learn about British history. It's an opportunity to, to really see a bit of Britain. So I decided, I always remember things when I write them down. So I thought I'll start a blog, publicly available, shame myself into, uh, into getting some momentum going. Um, and yeah, write a blog post about each, each property. Um, and then almost as an afterthought, I thought, I know, I'll have a scone at each property and the scone will be the common thread across each of them and I'll give the scone a little score. Um, and that afterthought <laughs> subsequently became quite a big part of what I was doing. Um, but that's how it started. So your blog, the nationaltrustscones.com, which is a fantastic resource now that you have completed it, uh, details every 
place that you've visited, every scone that you've tasted with ratings of the place, of the scone, and maybe something that was unique to that place as well. It's a fantastic resource. I, I um, recommend everyone to go and visit it. But you came up with that idea just after visiting the one National Trust place. Kind of. It was an idea that fell out of the sky into my head, I have to say. You know, I mean, it, it really did come out of nowhere. And sometimes great ideas are like that. You have to know when to hear the idea, right? So I it was Osterley House. I remember very clearly we'd been to Osterley House. I came out of Osterley House and I got in the car and I realized I couldn't remember a single thing about it. And I thought this is going to be a giant waste of my time and money if I'm going to you know, spend the time going around looking at National Trust properties. So that was the really the, the thing that made me think this is a problem. How am I going to solve this problem? And then, yeah, like I said, the idea for the blog just fell out into my head one day. I thought this is quite a good idea. And my husband like was very supportive and said, yeah, it's a good idea. Everyone else, friends and family thought it was utterly mad. And we're like, what? Why are you doing that? Um but I knew it would be good for me. And it was straight away. I got the immediate benefit that I would go somewhere and I would write about it and I would remember what I learned. So to give you an example, I think the first property, one of the first properties I went to was a place called Ham House, which is in Richmond. And Ham House is great, right? It's a kind of a Tudor building built on the river. Um, and the guy who had built it was um, the whipping boy of Charles I, right? So when you are a king, and you are being educated, the teacher is not allowed to hit you, right? So whereas like in a normal, you know, in a normal Tudor educational establishment, the, the kid doesn't listen, the kid messes about, the, the, the teacher could give him a whack around the head or whatever, right? You can't do that if you're teaching the future King of England, right? So there would have to be another boy brought in to sit next to the King. And if the King didn't do his lessons properly or misbehaved, it was the boy sitting next to him who got told off, the whipping boy. And so Charles first had this, friend who was of the whipping boy and uh, obviously they stayed friends um for good reason for all those years afterwards and charles you know gave him the land to build this this house and 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 yeah as the, as his as his longtime friend and whipping boy and i'd never i didn't know what the term whipping boy meant so there you go that's a brutal relationship to have <laughs> <laughs> and and but but in exchange for that he got land and yeah, grounds yeah. Which became Ham House. Yeah. Well, you became a courtier, right? So you know, you, you got to kind of like you know, leverage your way in the in the in the in the, in the court, um, depending on the relationship you had with with the king. So um, so yeah. So and there you go. That's just the first little gem that I was walking around, and that's just a tiny little factoid that you learn, and you think that's so interesting. And I, I it was those sort of little factoids that I was picking up. I mean. I'm not an architecture expert. I'm not a gardening expert. I'm not, you know, there's so many things in these properties that you can that you can really get into. Porcelain, uh, not my thing, um, but a lot of people do like it. But yeah, the stories about things like that really, really appeal to me. And that's what I wanted to write down. Why is it you think that, um, like you said, you got in the car and you forgot everything about the place that you've just been? It, that's a very common feeling, I think, for a lot of people who can be immersed in this uh, environment and learn these stories but actually like I'm trying to think now of places that I've been and I've don't know cannot remember many of the stories and histories that are places that I've been to like national trust places why do you think that is I think it's just because you you go you go with the purpose of having a day out don't you you know you're not going to learn you're going to to would go with your friends or family or whatever maybe you're going for a cup of tea or you know so you kind of go along and you sort of wander around and you don't know really what you're looking at and you're not necessarily taking it in and and that's that's what I wanted to to stop with the blog or that I wanted to change with the blog was I was going with the purpose of finding the great story you know I was looking for the nugget I was looking for the thing that I knew my my blog readers would go well, that's incredible. You know, that's such a great story. And then they start to read the rest of it. You know, then you can kind of get into, well, this was built in this time or it was built on the site of an old monastery. You know, it. if you go, yeah, if you go with the idea of learning about it was once a monastery and it was this and that and the other, then you'd kind of, you lose your own interest and you lose other people's. It's, it's the, it's the hook that you're looking for, for each property. And it's often hidden in the guidebook, right? I mean, you imagine a National Trust guidebook has probably got, what, 40, 60 pages or something. Um, and it's all about the in-depth, you know, history of the Neolithic people that lived there like long ago. And it's all really interesting, don't get me wrong. But then there'll be a tiny pull-out quote somewhere saying the third Earl's wife ran off with a curate or something. And, you know, and you're you're kind of like, that's, that's the interesting thing in here. You know, what happened behind that whole story? 
Um, and that's, I guess, what I've tried to do is to pull out the the really interesting, more people, I guess. Yeah, focused. the human stories. Yeah, the I was human about to stories. Say, that's what people enjoy the most. Like the, the whipping boy, everyone can picture just exactly how uh, harsh a relationship that is. But fundamentally, the story of how it ended is an incredible thing to, to have on your tongue. I mean, the whipping boy story, I mean, if you think about it, it, it is a, a human story that transcends the ages. I mean, you imagine being a whipping boy yourself and the skills you learn at a young age about how to make the person next to you behave, you know, like even if it is the future king of England, like that, that that doesn't change. You know, human nature doesn't change, right? So you, like you just said, you can really imagine yourself in that person's shoes. As an adult, he also had incredible John Bon Jovi hair. So I'll always remember the picture of him. I think there's a picture of it on the blog. He's got this like really, really bouffant hair in later years, like the like the the, the, the two Charleses did. But yeah, it's um it's as you can tell, I, I remember all about it, and I would not have remembered it if I hadn't you know been looking to write it down on the blog. So what made you want to visit the National Trust in the first place? Yeah, I mean, that was just one day. Um, my, I didn't go to the National Trust as a child. I, you know, I'd heard of the National Trust. Like a lot of people probably had a bit of a, you know, view of the National Trust as being a bit old fashioned. Um, and then so boring. Pete and I got a new car. And one day he just said, let's head out in the car and go somewhere. Um, so we went down to Kent, to Chartwell. He wanted to see where Winston Churchill had lived. So we went there. And yeah, we just got there and thought, actually, memberships, you know, reasonable bargain, 500 you know, places, you know, for, you know, I think it was like 70 quid at the time for the two of us. Um, we joined. There's some good sales people on location, I bet, maybe telling you all this. Well, they're, I mean, they, they don't, they're not hard, they're not pushy, the National Trust. Mm. It's a very, it's a very lovely organization, you know, it's, it's manned by volunteers. And that's interesting, actually, because when I was, when I started the blog, I'm quite a sarcastic person by nature. Um, and so when I started the blog, I had this image of me, you know, being a bit more sarcastic, I guess. And straight away, I realized, no, the blog is going to have to take a much more gentle tone of voice. You know, if you've got volunteers running things, you can't, you can't be rude about it in any way, you know. So, yeah. Ah, okay. This explains why many of your ratings on uh, on your blog are very high, very generous. And I appreciate what, why, that, why that is. Let's talk about your blog. So you challenged yourself to visit every single National Trust place that had a tea room that could serve you a scone. Correct. Okay. Actually, before we go any further, scone, scone. What's your thoughts on the pronunciation? Well, the thing is, Tom, that for 10 years, I didn't ever have to say it. The written word, you can hide behind your own pronunciation, right? So for 10 years, I never had to come down on one side of the fence or the other. And then obviously I have in the last few months. I'm a scone girl. Um, Cambridge University has done a great piece of analysis on, you know, why people say scone or scone. And it's all to do with where you're from. If you're from the north, you tend to say scone. If you're from the south, you're tend to say scone in the middle you're kind of one or the other that's where i fit yeah yeah i'm quite happy to bridge that gap and 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 do both as many of us do in the midlands um okay so you set yourself the challenge to eat a scone at every national trust place that could serve you a scone how many places are there so i did 244 um there are sorry there are 500 national trust properties I did 244, but there were a few in my 244 that didn't have scones, only a few. And I made uh, I made a sort of an exception for the Beatles childhood homes, for example, because I really wanted to go and see where John Lennon and Paul McCartney grew up. No scones there. Um, I went to Beatrix Potter's house in the Lake District. Um, there's no scones there either. So there's a couple in my in my 244 where I knew there wouldn't be a scone. Um, but the vast majority, I think 95% of the 244, yes, I was expecting to get a scone. So you set yourself some rules to visit every National Trust property in the 2022 handbook that had a cup symbol by it. If they do not have a cup symbol, but you've been made aware that they, there is a tea room serving scones, you may include them. However, it wasn't mandatory. If the property has a cup single, but the food outlet is no longer open or has no ways of serving a scone, you can choose to exclude those properties. I suppose it was important to have rules because it's a public-facing blog. 
Yeah. So the, I only had the scones in the last year. So for a long time, I kind of went along without really any rules. Like there's a whole area about tenant owned cafeterias, right? There are quite a few National Trust properties that have a tenant owned place. Were they included? Were they not? I took a very sort of broad view of it. And then when I got to the final year, I thought I do need to kind of nail my colors to the mast here because otherwise... I'd never finish, right? Unless I actually, you know, state. And there were people that really were very invested in this, right? Like, you know, you've missed this one, you've missed that one. And so I had to kind of, I had to really pin it down. So that's why I wrote the rules. Um, but there are, I mean, there were there were National Trust properties where there was a cup in the book, but then someone would message me and say, there isn't. I went there last week. And if it was someone I knew on my Twitter account who I trusted, um, then I'd be like, okay, if that person is really telling me there was nothing there and it's, you know, up in Northumbria somewhere, you know, I, I would think twice before I went. It didn't happen that often, but, you know, there, were, there was a certain amount of having to trust the crowd. Yeah, because it's, it's a lot of effort that must go into visiting all these places. Like you said, like we said at the beginning, something you've done over 10 years. How did you plan where you would be going? Because some stuff you can tick off when it's convenient, near friends, family. Other stuff is so far out that you're going to be traveling a fair distance to do. And you probably don't want to make that same journey multiple times. So it would be practical, right, to tick off a few in one go? Well, you'd think so, wouldn't you, Tom? Unfortunately, I I didn't really... Let's just say I probably could have done a better job at being a little bit more organised. I um, When I started, I really... I suppose I got a bit carried away with the with the excitement of going to the exciting places. So, for example, I remember going up to Lyme Park in Cheshire for a day, right? One day I just set off, went all the way up there because it's a great place. It's where they filmed Pride and Prejudice, the 1995 BBC um, Colin Firth coming out of the lake thing. So I got very excited about that. I went off to have a look at that one and came back again. So I, I didn't bother to see any of like, the rest of Cheshire. Um and to be honest, that that worked for me because I was doing a lot of it at weekends, right? And you can't necessarily just go away and you know see a whole area in in, in a weekend. Um, so it was a lot of kind of going off and doing one property on its own and then having to go back. I did a lot of road trips as well, though. And the, one of the beauties of the blog is the were the road trips. You know, the little trips around Cornwall, the little trips around Northumbria, the little road trips around North Wales. You know, when I did get the opportunity to use some annual leave and go and see a few things at once, they were the best of times. You know, they were great trips. Um, you can build a really good week's trip, you know, if you've got a load of little National Trust properties you want to see. So I loved that. Um, but yes, I did leave myself at the end. You should have seen the map at the beginning of 2022. And I was like, right, I'm going to finish this year. And I looked at the map and it was like just star up in Durham, star down in Cornwall, one in Northern Ireland, one in Kent. Like I couldn't have left it harder for myself. So there was no real method to the madness in there. It was all a bit, just get on with it. So how were those final tick boxes that were all in different places? I was a woman possessed in 2022. I mean, I really was, right? And that's what it took to get me over the line. I had to just literally make the list of, I think it was 30 or something I had and just go, right, I'm going. And then, um, yeah, just foot to the floor. Don't think about it. All right, Durham's a long way away, right? Well, you've got to go. So let's just do it, you know. And it was calling in a lot of favours as well. Like a lot of, you know, friends and family were sort of like, you know, um, galvanised to come out with me. It was hard work. The last year, there were times where I felt, oh God, is this going to be worth it at the end? Like, you know what I mean? The rest of it had been very enjoyable. The last year was quite hard and the National Trust kept opening new places. That was the real tricky thing at the end. It was, it was they opened a, they, it was an old golf course in Mablethorpe, um, which they turned into a nature reserve. And I looked at it and thought, no, they won't have any scones there. You know, it's just an old golf course. And then someone, one of my friends on Twitter, one of my scone community had blown up the picture of the opening ceremony and there was a blackboard saying scones. And she sent it to me saying, the scones, you have to go. And so November, I'm like getting my mum and my sister and we're going up to the seaside in Mablethorpe. We're hiring a caravan. It was, yeah, it was. Wow. Big. I know. It was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. But quite a lot of pressure as well. So it, it, it did become a chore at one point. 
it was a chore, but like, you know, you get to the beach in Mablethorpe and you, you're you having such a good time that you just think, actually, this isn't that hard. But it's, it it was, I did feel the pressure towards the end. And then at last, at last minute, someone messaged me going, you've been to Leith Hill, um, you've been to Leith Hill Tower, but you haven't been to Leith Hill House. And luckily Leith Hill is down the road for me anyway. So I was able to go back. So there was, there was a bit of a scare towards the end, just as I was... But like I said, I had the crowd, you know, I was definitely crowdsourcing the intelligence of have I missed anything? You know, where do I need to, to be going? Um, which was a huge relief to me. How did this crowd help you along your journey? Oh, my God. If I had to name one, the best thing really that came out of or one of the best things that came out of the mission, it was the National Trust Gone community. So I set up a Twitter account when I set up the blog, um, not expecting anyone to follow me, really. You know, I just thought, well, put it out there and then. And it slowly built up some followers. I think I've got about 7,000 now or something. Um, but there's just some amazing people, like just such good, fun people. We had great fun during COVID, um, you know, when everyone was in lockdown. People were baking scones. They were sending me pictures, you know. We would, we just, we tried to, we tried to keep a very upbeat and inclusive um, vibe on there. And I think we did. There's just, yeah, I loved it. I've just loved that whole that whole world and people really rooting for you as well. Like that was the thing. Like when it got to the end, I really felt like I was doing it on behalf of all of us, you know, that I was going for this last scone, but I had this 7,000 people behind me. I know it sounds mad, but that's what it felt like. At what point did you realize how much help they were and you started utilizing them? They were always helpful because the feedback on, you know, you know, as an art, as a kind of a yeah. like creative, you know, you, you kind of, you rely on feedback to keep you going, right? So so people kind of giving you feedback is a great thing. So all along, they've kind of been helping me to keep going. There were times when I'd get a bit fed up with it, you know, and I'd be like, is it worth doing this, you know, and I'd keep going because of them. But I suppose the year, in 2019, I met a member of the um, National Trust One community in real life. And I was chatting to her and I said, oh, you know, thanks for everything you've done. And she went, well, thank you. You know, I love, I love the Scone community. And that was the moment it changed for me. That's when I realized that actually, we were a community. It wasn't just my Twitter followers. It was like there was an organic kind of thing that had grown up where we were all sort of not meeting each other, but just everybody kind of recognized the characters within the group. Yeah. Um, and from there, yeah, it became a big thing. Like the Church of Scones. <laughs> it was a bit like that. Absolutely. And people, because like I said, all the ca different characters, you kind of, you got to know them. So even though like there's a, a printmaker called Jane and I've never met her, but I looked at all of her work. I feel like I know her, you know, it's, it's a, it's a really lovely thing to have a total bonus, but. Um, yeah. I, I bet looking back when you first had this idea to just start a blog, which I suppose was just about being accountable to yourself, right? Is setting yourself a goal saying, actually, I want to get my money's worth out my membership but i'm not going to do that if i just tell myself that once and forget it the next day if i have something public which i put online and i post regularly that holds hold some accountability to, to it but you would have never realized at that point the journey that you would have gone on not only in in the adventures that you've done out and about on the land but also how getting people behind you has really helped give it more purpose Oh, a hundred percent, and that's the thing. I, I knew with the project it was probably going to take me to places I didn't, I didn't know. Right, you, that's why I did it. Right, you know, I, I had no aspirations for it, but yes, that whole feeling of knowing that people are so happy for you and they feel so involved has been great. I mean, there was one, one of my old school friends contacted me a few years in and was like, "Have you seen this person that's writing about National Trust scones?" And I'm like, "It's me." And like, this was one of my, and she just hadn't realized that it was me, but somehow we'd still managed to find each other. So it definitely was building up a, a kind of community of like-minded people. So why did you choose to have a scone? Was it just because it's a common thing to have at a National Trust Cafe? Yes, I think the National Trust is synonymous with scones, right? Um, certainly it always was in my mind, you know, yeah, you go to the National Trust when you get a bit older and you have a scone. It was, in a way, it was a bit derogatory. And I suppose I was sort of, I wouldn't say I set out to change that, but I feel like I have along the way, you know, that I have tried to make it a bit more, um, a bit more interesting, certainly with the book, which I know we'll talk about, but that's, that, that helps to kind of, to make scones a bit more interesting. Um, but yes, it was, I could have chosen flapjacks. I could have chosen those pieces of shortbread they have with the, uh, acorn emblem on them and stuff, but no, it was scones. Nothing says 
Great Britain more than an afternoon tea with a scone. Why is that? Oh, I mean, it is, isn't it? It's just the greatest thing. I'd, yeah. I remember my very first cream tea. I don't know if you remember yours, but I remember mine. I remember when I was 17 or 18, I'd gone to Nuki for the weekends with my friends and someone said, let's call into a cafe and we'll have a cream tea. I'd never heard of a cream tea, you know? So, but I just remember being blown away, you know, this, the cream, the jam, the scone, like it is just an alchemy, isn't it? It's like, it's just, it's just these, these three individual parts that seem to make this amazing yeah. whole. It, seeing as you are an expert on scones now, why has it become synonymous with being a British tradition? What's the history behind it? I don't know. So the history behind it, I mean, scones have been around for a long, long time, right? Griddle scones have been around hundreds of years, if not thousands. Um, in in the 19th century, two things were invented, right? The National Trust was invented in, 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 in the 19th century, and so was baking powder. So baking powder came along and made it possible to give those scones like the lovely fluffy rise that they have, you know, that you couldn't, you couldn't have before. So they're cheap to make, right? They're not expensive. So if you imagine that in in the 18th century, you know, the 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 in, the invention of the car, the invention of the train was making people kind of go and do a little bit more tourist traveling at weekends or on their holidays. Um and locals, you know, in Devon or Cornwall or in these other regions realized that, you know, a cheap to make scone combined with some fresh produce like jam and cream made a very very tasty treat for these uh for these travelers day trippers and things that were traveling around so that's my understanding of where it came from um and it stuck right you know even now today going to a national trust property you've got to have something to eat in the cafeteria right and a cream tea is the best place to start yeah so in your opinion what makes a good scone oh it's always about freshness tom you have to you have to have fresh right it, it can't have been baked more than about five hours before the, the, the less the better right so and the fresher the better so a fresh scone number one so if you've got a fresh scone you're off to a great start you've then got the rise so a scone's got to have a good rise on it ideally the mouth the top of the scone should kind of separate from the bottom and you end up with this little mouth on the scone where it's almost like smiling at you like it's kind of separated if you go into that kind of territory then you know you're getting a really really good scone and then if it's fluffy in the middle that is a five star scone okay i'm smiling at the moment because this morning i put some effort in and and got my hands mixing some some dough, uh, making some scones. Oh, wow. Uh, but I'm smiling because you, you, the second point you talked about is the fluffy rise, which I'm not sure if I was able to to achieve, but I have some fresh scones. Oh my God, Tom, I'm so impressed. Let me go grab some now. Okay, I don't make scones very often um, and I haven't made them in, in quite a long time. I do though, they do give me fond memories of when I was baking with my mom as a child and making scones. I think there's something about it, getting your hands in the mixture and making the breadcrumbs out of the, the butter and the flour, which I think as a kid is so exciting because you can just get your hands in there and get messy. These might be unique scones that you might not have had before, po possibly out of the 200 odd that you've had. These are plant-based, they're non-dairy, which, which I don't think I'm doing them best justice <laughs> with how they've turned out. But that could be for many reasons. One, maybe not enough baking powder. Didn't get the rise. Two, maybe I kind of rolled them out a bit too thin and maybe I could have given them. These are things which you're nodding your head to, yeah. I, people really make make it hard for themselves with the cutting. You know, you see people cutting really flat and you think, yeah, like to get a good rise, you need to have quite right. a, quite, quite a, a wedge of a, of, a, of a piece of dough. So I think that's where people go wrong. Yeah. They expect this thing to kind of expand like a, you know. Like, like a, a cake, right? Yes. And that, they... I think that's where I was going wrong this morning, thinking, forgetting that uh, cakes can, can rise super because they're much lighter, but this is quite a heavy dough. Yeah. So I think that I think people make work life half themselves. This is amazing. I'm so impressed. So this is plant-based. So this is basically a non-dairy <laughs> version. So what did you um, use for the fat for the scone? So we've got a, a plant-based butter. There's uh, many brands out there in the supermarket aisles. I've used one called Vegan Block, which um, tastes and replicates butter the best, I think, of many people. I've tried to make like a clotted cream. Mm -hmm. uh, I could, You can buy it from the shop, a vegan clotted cream, but oh, I couldn't wow. find any. Uh, I've instead bought a vegan double cream, added some vegan butter to it, and then added some sugar and then whipped it up. So it's more like a whipped cream. It's not really like a clotted cream in that sense. Well, top marks for effort. Thank you. I think 
one of the things I've realized that with scones, it's hard, to, it, like, you might not be able to get them perfect, but it's hard to actually get them bad, I think. Generally, with the ingredients, if you mix them up well enough, there's not much that can go too wrong with getting a nice scone, as long as it's, like you said, it's fresh. So I think I've reached that point where I've got something that is going to be nice. You are absolutely spot on. It is very hard to ruin a fresh scone, right? It is really hard. But you appear to have gone, that cream is really tasty. One thing to note, for those who can't see, is that we've both dissected our scones and have gone about putting the cream and the jam on. I have put the cream on first um, and then the jam on second. You have done the opposite, the jam on first, the cream second. These are two different ways and there is a whole political movement around uh, which is the right or the wrong way. We can still be friends, Tom. It's fine, right? Like it's, this is, this is an indicator of how l- people need to live their lives, that we need to be able, I say scone, you say scone. We talk completely normally. Neither one of us changes. We just get on with the conversation, right? And it's the same with cream and jam. It's great that we love arguing about it. It's nice. It's a nice benign thing to argue about. I don't but... think, I mean, I personally, and this is maybe me coming as a, from the Midlander point of view from from where I'm from, I I don't really argue. I see that there's two, there's two ways of things. I have my own personal preference and you have yours. Not judging the way you're eating yours. I'm just happy that I'm eating mine the way that I am eating mine. This is really good. You've done a really, really good job. Hmm. A really good bake on that. Really tasty. Thank you. I've not had a scone in, in a long time and I'm actually really enjoying this. Have you put um, spices into it? No, it does taste spicy, right? It tastes so like there's a tiny bit of cinnamon in it or something. Not very much. It but just... does. Okay, that could be from two things. One, this is strawberry and tarragon jam. Mm. So there's a bit of extra thing coming from the jam. But actually from, I think I use coconut sugar. Mm. And something that's given it a bit of extra depth. I think that's what it is. Now you mention it, there is a coconut undertone. Mm. Great though, really tasty. I'm super impressed. But like you said, you cannot be a fresh scone. Can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. And I think that's the thing. People people occasionally do go, oh, why would I have a scone when I could have a piece of coffee and walnut cake or a piece of Victoria sponge? But it is the cream and the jam that turn it into a, you know, a seriously luxurious treat, right? Ah, yeah. And it's and it's the quantity of cream and jam that you can apply yep. for everyone's personal taste and then how you apply it which makes it that special experience because you get something that you are happy with because you've had a part in it. Completely personalised. So the two sides of the cream and jam debate, do they originate from Devon and Cornwall? Yes. And when you said about, you know, you're from the Midlands, you're very laid back about it. I'm from the Midlands as well, East Midlands, and I'm very laid back about it. But if you are from Devon and Cornwall, I get the feeling it's, part of their <laughs> genetic pride that they have to stand firm on it because some people really do mind right some people really do have a very strict um code of conduct on the whole jam cream jam first cream first thing um but yes the J- devon and, and cornwall are the, the, the originators of the two different approaches as far as i know so cornwall is jam first cream second and devon is cream first and okay. Um, jam second. So I'm from, I've gone the Devon way, you've gone the Cornwall way. Mm. Now, my understanding is that in Devon, cream is thicker. So it's more like a butter. So they put the cream on first because you kind of, you know, you rub you rub it on like it's butter. In Cornwall, clotted cream tends to be a bit softer. So you can't, you can't. That's the reasoning that I've got, I've heard. But the challenge when you go into a National Trust property and have a cream tea is that you get served the clotted cream in those very small tubs and they're invariably hard, right? The, the cream has got really hard in the fridge. So when you even with a clotted cream, sometimes you're kind of trying to you know, kind of get it out of the, 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 the plastic pot and it's a bit hard. So I don't know if it really applies. But I always find that for me, putting the jam on first is neater. And that's my reason for doing that. Right, okay. Yeah, interesting. My reasoning for the cream on first is is actually the, I suppose the the Devonshire way is it acts like a butter. So for me, it's 
it's the closest thing to butter, especially clotted cream, I think. Is it enriched with butter, I think, is it? Mm. And so, like you would butter toast and then put jam on top. For me, that's my mindset is having something buttery as a base and then putting jam on top of that. Although I've, what I've, I've done wrong, actually, and I should have done, is my second half of the scone I should have had differently to, to actually just... But oh, I've, yeah. I've gone straight for the for the way that I did it the first time around. Yeah, but I think everyone has their... Just they go to preference. I think it's very hard to change once you've done it one way. I, although having said that, I will let you into a secret. So there is a third, there's always a third way, right? There's always a third way. Mm, okay. So like with the pronunciation of scone and scone, I recently went to the town of Scone in Scotland. <laughs> so there you go. There's a third option there. And it's the same with jam and cream. So you'll have an argument, you know, or no, you'll have a gentle debate with people about whether it's cream first, jam first, and somebody would invariably say, but what about butter? And I've always been of the mind that there's no butter, right? There's cream and there's jam and that's all you need. And then I accidentally put butter on a scone when I was up in Scotland recently because I didn't think there was any cream. And then suddenly the man came and went, oh, here's the cream. And I was like, oh, thank you. And actually, I hate to say it, but butter and jam and cream is actually very nice. Okay. There's a tiny bit of salt in the butter that just gives it that kind of sl slightly salty kick. So I wouldn't do that normally, but I can see why people who are butter fiends would, would want that. Yeah, and then you're starting to layer on all these like luxurious, heavy, fatty items. And it's not a low calorie treat, is it, Tom? Let's be honest. <clears throat> How did you manage those times when you had to have multiple scones oh, very, in succession? Very easily. Um, there's a couple of things there. There's When we go to a National Trust property, you will tend to get a sweet scone and a savoury scone. Sometimes you get two sweet options. So you get a fruit scone and a plain scone as the sweet options. And then you get a cheese scone as a savoury option. So in most situations, that's what you get. The greatest thing that could happen is you arrive and they've got a scone of the month. So a banana and walnut was what I got in Kent, for example, or a cherry scone or something like that. They were the great days. But because of I trying to be consistent in my blog, I would always have to buy a sweet scone, usually a fruit scone, and the scone of the month. And I did get a lot of very funny looks because I'd be buying like one cup of tea or something and then these two scones and they'd be like, you've got two scones and yeah, yeah. But, you know, purposes of research, you have to you have to do this. Is that the limit then? Is, is one scone enough? Oh, yeah. I mean, when I started, when I started, the National Trust was not consistent in how they serve scones. So sometimes you would get two. You would turn up and they would have a cream tea consisted of two massive scones and, you know, you think, wow, this is you know, very generous. And other places you've got one. They've since made it very consistent. So you only get one scone with your cream and your jam or your cheese scone without cheese, um, cream and jam. Um, but yes, there were days. I can't remember how, I can't remember what the record was. I think the record was four. That's a lot. It is a lot. So four properties we did in one day. And you do get to that point where you're almost willing them not, the fourth one not to have a scone. Like you're like, I mean, that's the worst thing that could happen to me was I arrived and there was no scone. But yeah, there were times where I was struggling got to get on with it right you know someone's the tough job someone's got to do it and in those times when you're doing those multiples is this mission of yours this challenge getting in the way of you enjoying the moment of where you are because rather than enjoy a place and walk around it you then like well hang on have to hustle get to the next one that's such a good question nobody's ever asked me that before and that's such a good question I had a very strict approach to how I how I how I handled the, the, the whole process. So I'd arrive at a, at a property and go for the scone first because you're absolutely right. If I walked around the property first, I would walk around thinking that man's just had the last scone. Like I can see him. I can see he's had the last scone. He got in there and he had the last scone. Now there's no scones left for me and I'd get really worked up. So I had to just leave the property to second, go and have the scone, deal with the scone situation. And when I'd had the scone situation, I could go and focus on the rest of the of the experience. If I did it the other way around, yeah, I would literally be going, right, and that's nice, and that's nice. And then, you know, just trying to get myself to the cafeteria as quickly as I could. So the genuine, genuine fear at the end of the day that you might not even have a scone there. Oh, yeah, very real. Always. Does that scone. ever happen? Oh, yes. I mean, it happened a few, only a handful of times, but it was enough times for it always to be 
a dread. Can you imagine sitting on a train going to Durham for the day to go for a scone? That's a very long train journey to be turning over in your mind. What am I going to do if I get there and there's no scone? And then the relief when you did get the scone, but the stress of walking into the tea room and that whole like, are there scones? Are there scones? Are there scones? Okay, there are scones. There are scones. Are they definitely fruit scones? My. Yeah, it was it was a very stressful situation. The anxiety is real. Mm. Very. Which is interesting because the whole point of an afternoon tea, a scone with a cup of tea, is to sit down, relax and enjoy. Did it ever take the enjoyment out of it, knowing that you sometimes couldn't stay for too long? I'd like to think that for some of these properties, I would never have gone there if I wasn't doing the blog, right? So I went because I was doing the project. So if I went there and... I didn't get the, you know, I was in a hurry and I had to spend half the time eating a scone and I only got like a, you know, an hour to look around the property. Yeah, there were times where I felt I'm rushing this a little bit. Um, But like I said, chances are I wouldn't have gone there if I hadn't been doing it. So I didn't tend to worry about it too much. At this, I think we took, this touches on the compromise that you might have to make with yourself when you go about doing anything that is adventurous, anything that... um challenges you and pushes you out of maybe a comfort zone, uh, f- maybe forces you to do something against maybe your own will to do something at a much slower pace. Uh, quite easily, you could have perhaps visited every National Trust place and eaten a scone uh, over, let's say, 25 years. But you wanted to complete this in a shorter period of time, which did involve having to compromise with the time that you spent in places with the anxiety of going to a place knowing that if you didn't get what you wanted there, it would almost void your trip up there in the first place. Yeah. So that there was, in the last year, I went to Cornwall um, and I had a load of properties to visit. And I, 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 you're right, I did feel a little bit like at this stage, I was just, you know, literally box ticking, right? I'm like, I just need to get around these now, you know, and these are the last ones I've got. I've got to do this. And there were two properties that weren't open. So if you imagine like COVID basically stopped the whole the whole project for a couple of years, but even in the year post-COVID in 2022, I felt a little bit uncomfortable because there was still there was still an impact. There was an impact on, there wasn't enough staff. There was an impact on, on, on um, supplies, you know, flour and all different things. So I did feel like the properties that I was visiting in 2022 were getting a bit of a raw deal, really. Um, and there were two places in, in, in Cornwall where the, the tea room wasn't open. Um, and that did make me feel like, well, I'm not coming back. Like, they're not going to get another shot at this, you know, whereas the properties that didn't start, you know, I did go back occasionally if there wasn't anything. So you're right, it did... I did feel a bit uncomfortable about it. But look, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a... Like I said... I wouldn't have gone there if I hadn't been doing the project in the first place. So You have to have a deal with yourself. You can't let this take over too much that it's going to cause you mental strife. You're so right. That's exactly what you have to have. You have to have your idea of what is acceptable and non-acceptable and then live within that. And don't feel guilty if you you know, have to make some decisions sometimes that are not ideal, you know. Um, but yes, having that having that sense of I'm doing the best I can do is what kept me going. And then the rules at the end, like you rightly said, I had to bring in those rules right at the end just to make sure that I was making that clear to everybody, if that makes sense. So I'd always had the rules in my mind um, that tenant, tenant, so any National Trust place that had a tenant cafe was not mandatory for me. I always had that in my mind, but at the end I had to write it down, you know, so that everybody understood. Don't tell me I've missed somewhere if it's run by, you know, a family who don't follow the National Trust recipe or, you know what I mean? So, yeah, it, it was difficult. So over your time uh, visiting all these National Trust places, what has surprised you about that journey itself, of being in physical places all over the UK, which we had, I should point out it's England, it's Wales, and it's Northern Ireland because Scotland is managed separately. Correct. You must have seen so much from... The UK and learn so much about its history. What has surprised you about that journey? Oh, on two levels. So the first is the geographical kind of visiting that I've, you know, as you rightly kind of allude to there, I've been to places I would never, ever have gone to if it hadn't been for the National Trust. Um, the one that springs to mind of that, I don't know why it springs to mind, but it just does, is a place called Speak Hall, which is up in um, Liverpool. Um, 
And it's right next to John Lennon Airport, which the whole history of that, it started off as an airfield and then it became John Lennon Airport. And it's very, very interesting. It's across the Mersey from Ellesmere Port. So the Mersey actually kind of runs through the the, the, the property and it's it's not what you'd expect. You know, it's, it has a real kind of urban feel to it, even though it's a sort of old country house. So you have this sense of the old having the new built round it, which I found really quite interesting, which I would never have gone there if it hadn't been for that. So certain certain kind of geographical um benefit but I suppose the history side absolutely and that was one of the reasons that I did the blog my my history education I don't know about yours but I you know there's mine is definitely mine is definitely lacking as well so enlighten me if you can in just a few minutes with the highlights the highlights, the, again, the one that springs to mind immediately. So I learned nothing about the, U, the, the English Civil War. Don't know about you. I, we just didn't cover it at school at all. Um, which year, which period is this? This is in the 1600s. Okay. So, and what I love about the National Trust is that different properties give you a different... Things like the Civil War, the dissolution of the monasteries, there are certain events that just have an effect across every single property. So you go there and you'll understand what that what that property did during that time, if that makes sense. So to give you an example, like Mosley Old Hall, which is not too far from where you're from. It's one I, I know well, yeah. So Charles II hid under the floorboards in that house. He was over six foot tall, this guy, right? But he had to, when he was on the run from the Roundheads after, I think it was the Battle of Worcester, um, he climbed up in the tree, you know, the famous Boscobel Oak where he hid um, hid in the branches from them, um, which is where, where all the pubs are now called the Royal Oak. Um, he came down out of the tree and he got to Mosley Old Hall where someone hid him, a, a royalist hid him under the floorboards in the priest hole, I think. Um, and he stayed there for a couple of nights and then he got on a boat to France and disguised as a servant or something. So you go to that property and it's just a house in Cannock, right? It's just a house in Cannock that just had this moment of huge historical significance. And you go and then you can learn a little bit about the Civil War. And then if you want to, you can go away and you can read a book about it and learn more. And I loved that. I loved that sense of this is really, really interesting to me. Um, and all the other properties then touch on the Civil War as well. So everywhere you go, it's like this was royalist. This was, you know, this was, um, you know, parliamentarian or and you can see how these families fared, you know, the ones that chose one side or the other and what happened to them afterwards. It's I just a fascinating subject. Um, and that's just one example. There are lots and lots of examples of things that happened in history that affected the war, you know, the wars, obviously, and things like that that affected all these houses. So, yeah, fascinating. What shocked you most about some things you've learned in our in our own history? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I didn't learn anything about colonialism at school. I didn't learn anything about slavery at school. Um the one, the property that I found the most difficult, and bear in mind, I wasn't going around looking for this, right? I wasn't like trying to find things that I didn't like. I was doing the opposite. As you rightly said at the beginning, I, I'm very much an optimist. You know, I'm looking for good things. I wouldn't make, a, I'd make a terrible food critic because I just want everything to be brilliant. You know, I, I don't want to find a, a rubbish scone. Um, I don't want to find something in, in, in a history that I don't like, you know, but Powys Castle, was the one that really, I came out of there thinking, I'm not sure about this. It just made me feel very uncomfortable. And this is that, in Wales? Yes, correct. Just literally over the border. So it's not far into Wales. Um, very old. Um, and it's owned, I think it's still owned actually by the Clive family. And so Robert Clive um, was a man who went over to India. Um, and as a result, Powys Castle is filled with artifacts Um from a certain region of India that he brought back. And I just felt really uncomfortable. Like it, it, you got the feeling in this property that there was a lack of awareness of this. You know, like most National Trust properties you go to give you the facts. This property was built with the proceeds of plantations in the Caribbean that were part of the slave trade. Fact, right? It's not telling you this is, you know, this is a terrible thing and this house should be pulled down or anything like that, but it's giving you the fact so you can understand how it came about. And Powers Castle doesn't have that. You just get the sense that there is a certain pride in it, if that makes sense. And I felt uncomfortable. And it was my hundredth property. I remember I went there that day, excited that I got over this, you know, this hundredth uh, mark and I came away thinking, I really wasn't sure about that. Have you fed that back to the National Trust? I'm uh, not apart from the blog post, no. Um, 
It's another example, though, where the National Trust, I think, does an amazing job because what people forget is that the National Trust is not a homogenous organisation. So every property they have has got different different rules with the tenant, for example, or with uh, the family. So take Coat and Court, which again, I don't think is from a million miles from you, from in Warwickshire. So Coat and Court, the family, the Throckmorton family who own that, massive, massive uh, involvement in the gunpowder plot with the Throckmorton. It's a very interesting place. They negotiated a thousand year lease with National Trust. Wow. So when the National Trust in 1956 or whenever it was, I, I'm not sure it was the 56, but that rings a bell. When the National Trust negotiated to take over the house in that year, they negotiated a thousand year lease, which meant that the family doesn't you know, run the place anymore because obviously they can't afford to do it. That's why they had to, to hand it over to the National Trust. But they get to live there. So you maybe you go to Coton Court one Saturday and it's shut because they've they're having an 18th birthday party or someone's getting married there or something like that. So every National Trust property has a different relationship. Some of them don't have any relationship with the families that used to live there and the families have gone and it's, you know, it's very easy. But can you imagine trying to run a, 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 a National Trust property where there's a family who have owned it for hundreds of years and, and still feel a sense of ownership on that, even though, you know, financially that they don't. So and Powers Castle very much is still run by the Clive family. Um, and that's why I think that is the tone. It's a slightly different thing. So I feel sorry for the National Trust because I don't know how how they do it. I don't know how they manage to get as, as much consistency as they do, bearing in mind they're having to deal with all these sort of random you know, eccentricities that you wouldn't expect from any other organisation, if that makes sense. Yeah, so it's worth pointing out. So National Trust, they're Europe's biggest conservation charity, looking after nature, beauty and history for everyone to enjoy. They say they do that with the help of millions of members, volunteers, staff and donors. They care for miles of coastline, woodlands, countryside and hundreds of historic buildings, gardens and precious collections. The latter being things that that signify wealth, wealth in times where money came from areas which are places which, when we look back into our history, are certainly not the cleanest of places to get wealth from. You talked about links to slavery and colonialism. Do you overall do you, have you seen that that is a a message that is quite clear for, for everyone visiting places? It's a really big subject at the moment. It's you know it's I've always found it to be to be right. So when I in 2013 when I first went to Osterley House, I remember very clearly going into the house and there was a sign saying the house was built by Robert Child, who was owner of Child's Bank. Um, and they were very involved in the East India Company. So fact, right? That there was no big, you know, huge long explanation of what that meant. It was it was given to you as a fact, and then you could go away and read up on that if you wanted. Again, I knew nothing about the East India Company, so I had to read up on it to understand. I think in recent times there has been, you know, the National Trust has come under some criticism for for bringing these stories to the fore. And I, I I find it baffling because they always did this. This has always been what they've done. They've always given you the facts and they should give you the facts. If if a Penryn castle was built almost entirely with the pro, the profits of plantations out in the in the Caribbean, right? So so everything you see at Penryn Castle, and it's a beautiful building, um, but it's fun, that's how it was funded, right? And so you have to know that. So so for me, I think it's important um that that you know, that that is communicated and it is. Um, occasionally, I think the National Trust maybe, you know, highlights something and, and it, they highlight it in a way that some people feel threatened by it and it causes, you know, concern. Um, but like I said, at the end of the day, the National Trust has a responsibility to tell you, you know, how these places were built and and, and where the wealth came from. I guess it's also important to, to, to note that, I think I mentioned earlier, that it's not just historic buildings and gardens which they look after. It's it's coastline, it's it's countryside, um, and it's not just uh, a great hall or a great building that you can go into that that you can experience be, by being with the National, National Trust. Sometimes it's as simple as having access to a car park in somewhere remote where you can go for a nice walk. Many of them don't come with cafes. So, but I, did you use many of those on your journey to stop and see a, a place of natural wonder? Oh, very much. You know, I, I tried to see as much as I possibly could. 
Um, and I loved them. There were some absolutely beautiful places. So the one that again springs to mind is White Park Bay in Northern Ireland. So as you're driving between the Giants Causeway and Carrick Reed, which both have cafes, um, there's White Park Bay, which is um, this beach where a farmer brings his cows down to the beach. So you'll be standing on the beach and suddenly this herd of cows just kind of walks along the beach, which is incredibly uh, exciting or nerve wracking, depending on your, uh, you know, your feeling towards cows. Um, but those kind of places are just breathtakingly beautiful. Um, so, yes, I would stress that, that although I have focused on scone serving places, don't do that. <laughs> go go and see all the places because, um, you know, even the ones that don't serve scones are beautiful and have a lot to offer. So... In all the scones that you've tasted, everyone's going to come with its unique situation, circumstances surrounding where you are, um, what scone it is, in what mood perhaps you're in on the day and the journey that you've taken to get there, or whether you're having to be rushed. When you look back, and maybe it's hard to actually to pinpoint one of them, but is there a moment when you just had the most amazing experience was it something to do with the location of where you were? Perhaps that it had been a rainy day and the sun had cleared or you just had this amazing view somewhere or just being in such a snug environment that you just felt like this was this was a special place? That's another really good question. And I, I mean this genuinely when I say that it's almost the opposite for me that what I discovered is that every National Trust property has something amazing about it. And I mean that right? That they, everywhere I went, I found something that I could be, I could be really impressed by, whether it was just a great scone in the cafe. Maybe the property wasn't, wasn't that interesting, but the scone was amazing. Or maybe the scone wasn't that great, but the property itself was amazing. Um, every single one had something to offer. Um, there's a place up in um, Grantham called um, Belton Hall, um, for example. When I was um, well, older than you, but when I was a kid, there was a TV series on called Moondial. And Moondial was it. It was a book written by a woman called Helen Cresswell. And they made a TV show out of it. And it was on in the 80s when I was growing up. But it's set at Belton Hall. And the actual Moondial that's in the book is a sundial. But you can go and see it. And I remember dragging Pete all the way up there to Grantham to see this thing. He had never seen the TV series, didn't know anything about it. But that for me was a real moment, you know, that I got to see, you know, this thing that this book had been, that this book had been written about. And what made me laugh was there was only other one person looking at it and it was a woman of my age. And I just thought <laughs> clearly this, this only really resonates to women who were born in the seventies. And it just, it kind of made me laugh that, that, that everything, you know, everyone else had forgotten about this. As a, a coda to that story though, when I got home, I tweeted saying, been to Belton Hall, seen the moon dial, um, took a picture of it, obviously, and sent it up. And the a, a child actor who had been in the TV series had obviously got some sort of hashtag moon dial like, on his on his phone, and he replied saying, "I loved filming that." And we had this little brief chat about his experience. And so, you know, that's just one property. I don't know, obviously not every property's got a book written about it, but every single property had something that would leave me sort of feeling, like you said, a little bit warm about it and just thinking, I'm really glad I went there today. Um, there were a handful where I didn't, Powers Castle being the one, as I've just explained, um, a handful that I didn't, I didn't love as much maybe, but I know that doesn't, it doesn't sound very believable, but it's absolutely true that every National Trust property has a story. At what point in your journey, in your blog journey, did you start having conversations about writing a book? So interestingly, I started the blog and was expecting to get a cease and desist letter from the National Trust, right? I just thought, I'm waiting for this any day. They're going to get in contact and go, no, we don't want you to do this. Because I didn't know anything about the National Trust when I, when I started. And I didn't. So I kept going with it. Didn't hear from them at all. Um, occasionally, I'd get the odd tweet from someone who worked there as an individual just saying, oh, I love your blog or, you know, um, kept going. And then in 2016, out of the blue, I got an email from their publishing company just saying, um, we are writing a recipe book called 50 um, Book of Scones, 50 Recipes of, of Scones from National Trust chefs around the country. Um, would you like to be the author of it um, and provide some excerpts from your blog um, to sit alongside the recipes, which I was really impressed by. You know, the National Trust could have done that without me. You know, the fact that I'd been spending three years, you know, going around doing this project, they could have just ignored that. 
Um, and I felt like by acknowledging that I existed, you know, they didn't, it, it was just very nice of them. Um, but the book definitely benefited from the copy. You know, when I finally got the book in front of me and I could see what they'd done, they had the recipe for, you know, cherry and almond scones, for example, and then a little piece of text about, you know, a property. It worked really well and it's a lovely book. Yeah, know? so it's a book, like you said, it's 50 recipes for scones. But alongside that are stories from select National Trust places, which you have visited, obviously. Um, and I think why it's so much better that you are the author of that is because you're not attached to the National Trust. So it's a very much a, a member's journey. And it's so much more personal than if it was just National Trust trying to sell themselves with these main points from these places. You were there walking the same walk that so many hundreds, thousands of members will be doing. And it was your experience which will inspire many people to go visit different places. Yeah, that's really nice of you to say that. And I think you're spot on. I think that I think it does do that. It gives people, like I said, it gives people the little nuggets that maybe the National Trust doesn't think are important. But to a to a visitor goes, Oh what, really? Wow, that's amazing. You know, so so you're right. I think it does give a visitor perspective. Um, there's one property in the book that doesn't serve scones um, and I was quite surprised it was included um, Clouds Hill which is where Lawrence of Arabia used to write his books so he was in a military base nearby and he had this little tiny hovel where he would go and listen to his gramophone records and write his write his books um, and it's tiny um, it's still there you can go and see it um, but it's a great story so I can see why they included it in the book but I hope no one ever saw that recipe and thought oh I'll head down to Clouds Hill and get my uh, you know my uh, whatever recipe it was because um, I don't serve them so what was the creative process like for for you was it as simple as just passing over some copy that you'd already written about places or did you have to do any further work yeah so I had a brilliant editor a guy called Peter he he did most of that kind of like picking out the things that he thought would would resonate um I wrote I had to do some extra work I had to obviously write the introduction and some other bits and pieces to it there was a couple of properties where I had to kind of hastily go and and do them you know because they wanted to include things um so um so yes, it was a kind of a combination. There was some extra work, um, but it was also drawing a lot off what I'd done before. It's an amazing part of your story because if I think if you'd have set yourself that that task at the beginning to write a book about this, it would have been a very different experience. But because you didn't have the pressure, you just allowed yourself to post regularly um, for each property. It enabled you to build up something over time. And then that could form something and it could even form many different varieties of different books. The blog itself could be a book itself. Has that ever been something you've considered? It hasn't actually. And again, it's a great point because I I remember very clearly about two years into the blog, I was running, I was running down the river path and I suddenly thought I could turn the blog into a book. And I just, I just removed the thought from my head. I was like, who'd want to read that? Like I, I just, it, it wasn't why I was doing it. You know, I, I did the blog for myself really um as a way like we've discussed earlier of learning and 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 kind of keeping note of where i had been and what i'd learned so far um but i'd always wanted to write a book and it was a, an absolutely amazing moment i mean i i never thought it would happen even when i signed the contract i was thinking i bet this is this will never happen this is too good to be true um and i just signed it and then one day i'll never forget it one of the members of the, the people who works at the national trust sent me a picture saying I've just seen next winter's merchandise something and there was a picture of the book and I thought, oh my God, it's real. Like it's actually, it exists and it was a lovely moment. And I do hope that, that as an inspiration to other people that sometimes the projects that you do set out with, you know, if you can just enjoy the journey, you know, don't necessarily think I'm going to write a book. I'm going to just do exactly what you've just described, gather up enough, enough material that I'm happy even if it remains a blog and then it turns into something like that. It's 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 really, it's worth it. You know, it was a great moment, a really great moment. It sold a lot of copies as well. It has sold a lot of copies. So, you know, that should have been an indicator to me that National Trust Scones was way more popular than I had, had understood. Um, so when the whole media storm happened, I shouldn't have been as surprised as I was. But um, yeah, it's their bestseller. It's a good combination. People love National Trust, people love scones, people love cookbooks. Um, so congratulations for it to be such a success. It's an amazing part of the story, as I said. Uh, I'm definitely before we, I'm definitely gonna convince you to turn your blog into a book. <laughs> um, especially if you have contacts with, with publishers at the, at the National Trust. I, I think 
and maybe I'll talk to you afterwards about this. There's definitely a few examples I can think of of people who have blogs. Oh, I think James Hoffman, the coffee man. Do you know mm. him? No. He did a blog on, it must have been different coffee places around the UK perhaps. And his blog got turned into a book and it was a very successful book, much more successful than his blog, which was successful in its own right. And I think once you kind of turn something from one medium into another, it kind of has whole new audiences. So if a lot of the groundwork is already there, it wouldn't take too much, I think, to adapt it into something which could tell a much bigger story as well as the mm. whole journey of that as well. Not to pressure you in any way, but I think that would be something that would be a success in its own right as well. Yeah, thanks, James. It's a good idea. I, I should think about it. I don't know. I guess it's just, it feels so um, it feels so kind of personal to me, really. I don't know. I'll think about it, definitely. Uh, it, just before we leave the book, uh, there's 50 recipes for scones. Uh, one would ask, why is there so many recipes for scones? Because simply scones are scones, right? But uh, enlighten me, why is there so many recipes? Well, there's many answers to that, but I'll give you my favourite answer to that question. So when I was, I think I was about a year, two years into the project, I got an email from a guy who worked for the National Trust called Rob Conwell, who is an amazing man. So he was the chef at a place called Dunwich Heath, which is in Suffolk. And he was running a scone-a-thon where he was attempting to sell, well, he did. He baked 30 different types of scone um, and you could go along and buy these scones. I mean, some of them were savory, many of them were sweet. He had everything. He had Malteser scones. He had he had just so many different varieties. Don't know how he did it in one day. I think he got up at 2 a.m., he said, to kind of to get all these scones baked. He was amazing. And I just, I thought he was such a great guy. And he invited me up and, you know, we had a lo lovely day up there. And so I knew he'd contributed a lot of the recipes to the scone book. Um, so I knew they they worked. You know, I knew this wasn't just like a, hey, let's try and spin a scone out in 50 different ways that don't really work. You know, I knew that Rob had sold a Marmite scone. I mean, there isn't a Marmite scone in the book, to be clear. But, you know, the, he had sold all these different different types. So I knew it was grounded in reality um, and there was, a, you know, an appetite for them. When you say that now, talking about Maltesers and Marmite, there you can actually be very creative with them with suddenly what you put in it. Uh, what in the book is your favourite scone recipe? That's a very good question. I think it is the Christmas pudding scone, um, which I had the Christmas pudding scone with brandy butter before the book came out. I had that up in York, loved that. And that made that made the recipe was in, included in the book, which is great. But there are many other recipes in there that you might not think would be exceptional, but really are. So the Earl Grey scone, like, you know, it doesn't sound like it would be particularly, um, you know, amazing in its taste, but it really is. It's such a lovely scone, a really fresh, lovely um, afternoon treat. And the other one is the chocolate orange scone. Ooh. So, yeah. So that one, there is a property actually in York called Goddard's, which was owned by the Terry family. So they built the Terry family as in Terry's chocolate orange. They, but they, own, they ran the chocolate factory and they built this house and you can go there. And so that that recipe in the book is kind of obviously next to the the piece about Goddard's. Um, and there's a triple chocolate scone as well, which is just mind blowing. I mean, you, you hear it, you think, well, triple chocolate, anything's going to be all right. It, it takes it to another level. So there's just all these different recipes in there where you, you sort of the joy of trying them out and realizing they are mind blowing is something. Yeah. Now that you say it, I can't think of a different type of scone that I've ever had other than a traditional scone. What goes in the old grey one to make it? Tastes like that. Oh, great. Ah, Pretty. You make the tea. You make a tea. You put it in and it just, it, you just, you think Ooh. this isn't going to taste of anything. You could do the same with coffee. You could. Yeah. So I did see, I haven't, it's not in the book, but I did see a, a chocolate and espresso scone yeah. once, which I thought was really nice. I haven't tried that one though, so I couldn't tell you about it. But yes, there are some, I mean, you, you say, you know, that you're right. The plain scone, the fruit scone are the normal ones. But in Northern Ireland, when you go to Northern Irish properties, it's cherry scones all the way. They, they, so they, why is it cherry? I, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know why they have cherry, but cherry, you everywhere you go in Northern Ireland, that's what you get. And they're lovely. How did you tackle all the Northern Ireland properties? Because that is logistically the biggest gap crossing a, an ocean. Yeah, I, I did it all in one go um, in 2019. So um, after Pete died, actually, I decided to to head out and start to tick some of these properties off with a bit more with a bit more of an attack than I had previously. Until then, it had all been a little bit, um, it had been done a little bit like here and there, the weekend here, weekend there. And I was like, no, I'm going to really try and get some of these done. So I flew over, 
picked up the prior car in Belfast and then I just drove literally like round to all the different properties. I mean, Northern Ireland has got some amazing National Trust properties. Like, you know, it's got the Giants Causeway, which is amazing on its own, but then it's got so many other lovely properties. Um, so for example, I went to one property that was in Enniskillen. And, you know, I was grew up in the 80s, you know, where places like Enniskillen, you know, have, have quite negative connotations in your mind. And to go there and to see it, a beautiful historic town, city with, um, with this lovely, you know, National Trust property in it. It was a real, again, another great example of how getting out into the world and seeing places that you would never normally go to is so important. Um, yeah, I love that. You mentioned your, your late husband, Pete, who you started this journey with. Um, many years ago, uh, but unfortunately you lost him uh, midway through this journey. How has that formed part of this journey? Yeah, well, very unexpected one, obviously. Um, yes, so he was diagnosed in 2016. So the, I, the, the book, I started work on the book and was so happy about that. And then shortly afterwards in the October, he got diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's non lymphoma. Um, and at first, like, like a lot of people get sick, you think, oh, this will be over. You know, this is a short-term problem. We'll just deal with this and then we can get back to our normal life. And it didn't happen. He was sick for 18 months. And, you know, in, in that time, we didn't do an awful lot of the project. Occasionally we went, you know, to a few places. Um, so the project went on hold. But it certainly, it certainly gave us something to do, if that makes sense. Like I remember going to Snows Hill, which is a lovely little weird manor house in the Cotswolds. And we went there on one of the last um, trips we did together. And it was lovely, you know, to do something that belonged to life before illness. And we were still doing it. We weren't doing it because he was ill. We weren't doing it instead of anything else. That was what we would have been doing if he was well. That was really good. You know, it kept some sort of sense of normality. Um, and he loved it. I remember looking at it thinking this place looks really boring. Like, oh my God, we're going to drive all the way to the Cotswolds and it's going to be really dull. And what am I going to do? And we got there and he just, it was one of the best. As is always with the place of the National, never underestimate the National Trust, right? Because every property is just, has got something you don't expect. And it was amazing. So that's always will be very, very close to my heart, that place. How did you navigate your mindset when you restarted the trips to the National Trust? On your own? I think at first I was sort of like, yeah, I'll carry on like I have been, um, you know, the weekend trip and, you know, it's great that I had it and it was lovely. And then I had this sort of epiphany about a year after he died where I thought, I haven't actually learned any lessons from this. You know, Pete was really looking forward to his retirement and he didn't make it, you know, like th this idea that you're going to get to retirement and have all this time. Not that I was going to leave the project till my retirement, but you know, that kind of mentality of I've got all the time in the world, you know, I just, I can do things in my own time. doesn't exist. Um, and that was when it had a huge effect on me because I remember thinking one day, if I, if, if, if I just could do anything this morning, what would I do? And the answer was I'd get in the car and I'd go and finish my scone project. And that was the answer. Um, and I was having grief, grief counselling at the time through work. And I said to this woman, I explained how I was feeling. And in the end, I realised I needed to leave my job, you know, that I love my job. It was really good, but I needed time out. You know, I'd, I'd really been working too hard. So I left and I spent August 2019 just driving, like just going. I think I did about 22 properties in a month um, all over the place as well, like Northern Ireland and Cornwall and Devon, everywhere. Um, and it was absolutely brilliant, exactly what I needed, just just to be free and to be on the road and to be doing something that this is what I would do if you gave me the choice of anything, if that kind of makes sense. Um, and I loved it and did it for a whole month. And then I kind of got a job again and went back to work, re rejuvenated. How has that experience helped you reframe how you spend your time in life? It's made me much more aware of how precious time is. So, you know, when you're at work, you know, you're kind of going from one meeting to the next and it's a task thing and you just do it and then the week starts again and then the month starts again. And, you know, there's just this sense of you never really sit back and go, well, where actually am I at? Like in my life, you know, where have I got to? Um, what am I expecting my life to look like now? Um, and it has taught me that definitely. Um, the project as well. Like I think the fact that I had the project to be able to, to, to make the break from work and to go and do that thing, would I have left my job to do that if I hadn't had the project? Probably not. So the project for me was the, was, the, was the way of being able to say, I'm going to leave doing this and I'm going to do this. And then that will be the gateway to my future life without Pete. And I think that's the thing. Um, 
that I was very lucky to have it because it really did give me, it gave me something. Um, Because I think leaving to go to nothing would be very hard, you know, just leaving because you just felt really overwhelmed. And I can imagine that could be quite lonely. Mm. Um, And I had friends and family, like, because they all just like rallied, right? I mean, they really did. It was everybody was coming out with me. I was, you know, going over here and meeting this friend and over there and these family members and everybody helped. And that sense of, you know, of everyone being with you was really important as well. Um, so I got a lot, of, I got a lot of things out of it. I mean, obviously it's incredibly sad and, you know, it, yeah, it, it was unforeseen, but it, it definitely helped. Um, it helped me get through it. Many of us experience loss um, at various stages of our life. What did you learn about how, to cope with something that's so life-changing? I don't know. One thing I've learned about grief is that every single case of grief is completely different, right? Like there is, just because I've lost my husband doesn't mean that someone else who's lost their husband and I will will completely have the same experience, right? It's so personal, so personal. But you, within that, you know that. That's what you get as the gift. That that's that's the gift you get given. Is that my experience is not going to be the same as yours. We can share a few thoughts on that. Um, but yes, the way you've dealt with it is very different. So for me, it was just about the deep breath of like, okay, what does this mean for me? Um, and like I said, that kind of thought process of. I need to now think about where I want to be. I need to learn a few lessons from it for myself, for my own life. Um, It's brought me much closer to my in-laws. And again, the project was a really important part of that because they really looked after me, you know, his family. Um, And so being able to involve them in the project just kind of gave me something else, you know, to keep that whole network going with them. um, So I didn't lose that. Um, So there's so many things, Tom. There's so many angles into it. I think it's just... The only thing you can do when you've been bereaved is to be kind to yourself. You know, that when someone passes away, I think you immediately start to go back over all the things you did wrong, especially when there's been an illness involved. I think, you know, you know, what could I have done differently? You know, oh, I shouldn't have done that or I should have spent more time doing this. And it's just you can't. You have to just be kind to yourself. And that's the main thing I learned is be kind to yourself. Never forget the person. Never forget anything that's gone on. But just, you know, find a way um, to move forwards with that with that self-care you finished your project going back to giant's causeway which was one of the first national trust properties you actually visited well before this project was a thing um why did you choose to go back there the first main reason was that obviously i was going to be finishing without pete right so i knew that um, and Pete and I had been to the, to the Giants Causeway together. We'd been there many years before we even joined the National Trust. So in twenty in two thousand and six, um, we hadn't been together that long. Actually, I think it was on our one of our very first dates. Um, I'm a Brentford uh, fan, so I took him to a Brentford football match. Um, I can't remember who it was against, but I took him to this match, and by some complete miracle, I won the halftime draw. So they used to carry around this blackboard with the winning ticket number on. And it was going around. I remember going, that's my number. So we went um, afterwards and picked up my 246 pounds, I think it was, um, and uh, and used it to pay for flights to, to Belfast so we could go to the Giants Causeway. I'd always wanted to go to the Giants Causeway. Our headmaster used to tell us the story of Finn McCool, the giant. So a big life ambition. And we went, loved it. We both really loved it. But I didn't realise it was National Trust. Or if I did, it wasn't important to me at the time. You know, it was, it's such a big tourist destination, the Giants Causeway by itself, that, um, you know, you don't need to know really who's running it. Um, So yeah, so when it came to finishing off, I thought, well, Giants Causeway, Pete went there. I know how much he loved it. Um, I know he went there. So that's a nice, a nice, a nice way of involving him. Um, but also it's a big place with a very big cafeteria. Um, and I knew I'd get a scone. The thought of turning up to my final, you know, big finale and them saying we haven't got any scones would have been a disaster. So I thought I'm give myself the best chance of success um, and go there. How did it feel sitting there getting your final scone being delivered to you and feeling a sense of completeness in, in, in that challenge? The overriding emotion was just relief. If I'm being really honest, it was just relief. It was like there was a scone. There was a scone. And at the time, I didn't even care if it was a good scone. I just was like, there's a scone. Um, so I got the scone and I ate the scone and I realized the scone was amazing. But I think I think I was so sort of 
like completely overwrought by the whole experience because I'd been so worried um, that I ate the scone. I was like, that was an amazing scone. And I had to go back the next day just to make sure that it was an amazing scone and that I just wasn't completely, you know, um, overcome with the whole, you know, the whole experience. And it was a great scone. They definitely do good scones there. So it was a relief was the number one emotion. And then just a feeling of sort of like, well, that's that then, you know, and sort of like, you know, getting your stuff and leaving and going somewhere else, you know, for the rest of the day and and just not not knowing for one minute that there was a huge media storm about to start because at that time it was, you know, I had no idea what was coming. So, um, yeah, it was it was quiet. And so how did it feel writing the last blog post? Weirdly, it was the hardest, as you probably had already guessed. Because, so I finished it. If you imagine, I finished the project. Um, we were in an Airbnb. I got home, we went out for dinner. And then I promised to do an, an interview with the Press Association. They'd been following the blog for the last few months. And they said, this is quite interesting. And I was thinking, hmm. so they rang me. I did this interview. Um, and then the next day, like they sent me a link going, it's in the Independent. And then I got a text from a friend saying, I've just seen you on the BBC website. And then it just went on and on and the phone was ringing and it was just it went absolutely total mayhem and that carried on for about two weeks so I never had the chance to actually sit down and write like the final blog post and I kept thinking before it was even complete you were just getting media oh my gosh yeah I hadn't written up the last post at all it was just it was in the paper and so it was everywhere and every time I'd think well that's it then you know and then the BBC would ring or this morning would ring and I'd be thinking oh my gosh and it's time consuming I mean you know I know it's a bit of a you know not exactly a problem is it but going to going to Wogan House to be interviewed by Jeremy Vine takes your your day you know going up to BBC studios to weirdly the 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 um, studio in White in White City to be interviewed by Holly and Phil takes your day, right? So, so all this time was kind of going away. Um, and so when I finally sat down to write it, and it, it, the reason it's such a great question is because I always prided myself on my ability to write that day. So even if I'd been up to Durham, I would get back and I would sit down and I would try and write my post at speed because I wanted to capture the feeling of it. You know, I didn't want to kind of ponder on it for like five days and then I wanted to be immediate, you know, and also practice my writing at speed. I, that was a really big thing for and me. It, and crucially, it gets it done yes. creatively because then you can move on to the next one, which is so important with creative projects is making sure that you don't dwell too much on on something for too long because it can just stir in your head and sometimes you just need to get it out there, move on to the next thing. A hundred percent, Tom. And that is the piece of advice I would give for both for starting the blog in the first place. Like I had the idea, like I had the idea and I set it up within like days. Like I didn't hang about like thinking it over. I just thought, you know, no one's watching. So what can I lose? You know, and I got on with it. And then yes, absolutely. If you start to think about, and that's why the Giants Causeway post took so long because I started to think about it. It started to take on like, you know, this importance in my mind where, where do I even start? Like, how do I even get the first paragraph done? And, you know, you, you just need to do it just write it you can always rewrite it you know just write and that's the thing completely right this online community that you'd built up for your blog were they knocking on your door being like where's this last final blog post were they demanding it no they're too nice that's the thing about the national trust gone community they're really nice so nobody was demanding it i think they could all see that i was otherwise engaged um yeah going on heart fm and stuff yeah what was that like the your your kind of five minutes of fame in that flurry of two weeks of you talked about Holly and Phil on this morning, Heart Affair with Amanda Holden, Jamie Thinkston, been on the BBC. You talked about New Zealand television came on you, t- around your house at 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. It would be a little whirlwind. It was a whirlwind. And like I said, like every time I'd think, well, that was over, that was fun. Then someone else would get in contact and I'd be like, oh my God. The, the best example I can give you is the BBC, right? So I can remember exactly where I was. We, I'd gone to a National Trust property um, called Divvies, which is like a, a mountain just outside Belfast. On the way back to Belfast Airport after our trip, we went there and I was standing on the hill and my phone rang and it was a woman from the BBC breakfast saying, um, we'd really like to get you on. We love the story. Can you come on tomorrow morning? This is a Saturday morning. And I was like, thinking, well, I'm in Belfast. I, I'm, you know. So I said, I'm really sorry. I won't be able to get back to England and up to Salford um, in time. Um, and she's like, okay, that's a shame. And I put the phone down and, you know, like I was a bit like, oh, that would have been like exciting to go on BBC breakfast, but thank God I couldn't do it because, you know, I would have just melted with nerves and I was just breathing this enormous sigh of relief. She rang back and said, can you come on on Sunday? And I thought, I haven't got an excuse to say no. Like, 
there's no reason. So I was like, okay. And then just was so scared for like 48 hours while I like went home to London, packed a little bag, got a train to Salford, got up in the morning. Like just even now I can feel my nerves, just how scared I was. Um, but yeah, just such good fun. Just that was such live. An experience. live. Yeah, there's, some, there's something about live broadcasting, which is very, very nervous. Oh. And especially if you're not, uh, not used to it and you're not in control. But those presenters are really good. And that's the one thing I realized is that they are very good at making you feel calm. So I had Roger and Nina were on the day I was on and I'm their biggest fan now. It was like it was like having a couple of mates. They were just so nice to me. And I was the last item. So, oh, you know, by that last item, everyone knows you're now into the world of, right, this is just a nice thing to end on. And there was a group of golfers who'd gone on before me who had, who had given someone CPR on a golf course. So they had a really good story. Um, and as the guy came out, he went, don't look at the monitor. And I thought, okay, that's the piece of advice because apparently he looked at the monitor, saw himself and went to pieces. So, you know, that was a, a last minute piece of advice, which probably saved me. Sounds amazing. I, I mean, talk about an adventure itself. Like this, the whole, your whole 10 years has been some crazy adventure. And like I said at the start, you don't have to cross countries and be doing something physical to have an adventure. The stories that you've been able to tell me are, are phenomenal in itself. Um, if someone is so inspired by our conversation that they're going to uh, look into um, their local National Trust place, of which I'm sure they'll be surprised, why? Tell me why they should do that. People should visit the National Trust because, as I said, that their stories are phenomenal, right? That's that's the reason to go, right? Because you learn so much from, you imagine like there's a house that's been there for centuries and centuries. It's seen so much going on in it. And the National Trust as a charity is keeping the doors open of that place. It's preserving it from Death Watch Beetle or whatever else, all the different things that could be attacking that building and causing it to be pulled down, right? So you joining the National Trust is keeping those buildings, those pieces of coastline, those pubs, all the different things that National Trust owns, it's keeping them open and keeping them keeping them safe. So by joining the National Trust, that's what you're doing. And then by going there as well and spending like, you know, some money on a cup of tea, you're also, you know, contributing as well. So so although you get loads out of it, you've got to remember that at the end of the day, you know, the National Trust is also getting a lot out of it and you're keeping um, these incredibly important, you know, historical buildings or, you know, pieces of, of, of land alive. And I think that is the reason to go well i'm sure everyone will be surprised with what they can find on the website or by the app uh, i'm going to finish with asking you about uh, three places that i've highlighted that um that are special to me um before that i just want you've told us stories of many different places is there one last story of a certain place that you feel you want to tell us um before i move on to the three that i've got listed here so do you know what? There isn't a single property that I would pick out that I could tell you about because there are so many. We'd be here all day, right? And I think one of the, please don't test me on this, Tom, but one of the beauties of the blog is that I do think I could remember something about all 244 because that's why I did it, to help me remember. And it has worked. So I can remember, I think, something about everything. But again, please don't test me on that because um, I'll probably make a fool of myself. But no, the short answer is... There is no favourite from my side. They're all brilliant. Well, I'm going to test you because I've got three listed here. So these are two of them are local to where I grew up. And then one of them is just one of my favourites, I think, that I that I know of. I've not been to many and I'm, I'm ashamed to admit that. I think a lot of the time when I'm on holiday, I do use their car parks more often than others. And so hiking in the Peak District or using access to the beaches in like Cornwall, places like that. Um, I have more familiarity with their, with their car parks. So... First one, Whittick Manor, which is uh, within the Wolverhampton limits, which is where I'm from, is probably the one that's closest to where I grew up, I think, thinking about it without actually checking. It's a place that I probably, as many people do in their local area, took for granted. Um, I have visited and I have, vis I have seen inside as well, which is is important because it's not just the gardens and the and the building. I've got what you wrote about it here. I'm just going to actually read uh, this. I thought it's quite a humorous uh, anecdote. You said in your blog, I'm thinking of writing a book called How to Persuade Your Other Half to Visit National Trust Properties. There is an art to it and I believe I have perfected it. Take the conversation I had with Scone Sidekick and Whittick, about Whittick Manor. 
You said, I really want to go to Whittick Manor. Him. Where is it? Me. Wolverhampton. Looks aghast. That's miles away. What's there? It's a house built and furnished in the arts and crafts style. It, it has William Morris wallpaper, pre raphaelite art, and De Morgan pottery scattered throughout. Him. Continues to watch the one show. You. It's the one on the front of the Houses of the National Trust book, which you hold up. Him. Oh, okay then. And you say the moral of the story is that every National Trust property has something going for it and Whittick Manor is very photogenic. You said, in fact, I would go as far as to say that Whittick has the single most beautiful room in all of the National Trust. It's the Great Parlour and it was designed to look like a great hall, but with beautiful furnishings. There's even a minstrel's gallery at the back. You gave Whittick Manor a 5 out of 5, the Scone a 4.5 out of 5, I won't ask why, and the Great Parlour a 5 out of 5. Yeah, that great parlour is, I can still see it. It was beautiful. When you talk about, you know, where you go to places and you think, oh, I could live here. I could sit in this room. That's one of them. Yeah, it's a lovely, lovely property. It's a very impressive building from the outside. I don't know if you remember that. It's kind of got yes. black and white out outside and then inside it's very much arts and crafts. So it's quite modern. In fact, if, I, if memory serves me correctly, I think it's one of the newest National Trust properties in in their ownership. Because I think it was only built in the Victorian era. It's not old. And they had to persuade the National Trust to take it on. It's just an example of something which I've just never really appreciated. But seeing and hearing you write about it and come uh, to visit it and say, and from uh, certainly from your experience with the comparison that you have to others, just how amazing that experience was for you, filled me with a bit of sense of pride that that's kind of, but also a bit of regret that I've never, uh, never really appreciated it while I was there. But hey, Tom, we've all do it, right? Like if you said to me, oh my gosh, there's this place in, in the Midlands where they, the church has this enormous bone crypt in it and it's so interesting. I, I'm like, yeah, I grew up there. Like, you know, like every, everywhere where you grow, up, grow up. Rothwell in Northamptonshire. It's got this really old bone crypt in the, in the bottom of the church, which is very spooky. But when you... A bone crypt? Yeah. What's that? It's basically where they used to keep the bones of people who died, where they, they didn't have room for them in the graveyard anymore. So they used to just chuck them in this so big they, room. So they would dig up the bones? Yes, and just put them into like a, into into the ground. So then they could bury more people? Yeah. And then one day in the Victorian era, I think, a grave digger was digging a grave and fell through the hole into this whole bone crypt where they've put all these plague victims or whatever they were um, and thought he'd fallen to hell because uh, he there was suddenly all these bones around him. And so now you can go down this little stairs under our like our parish church and all these bone skulls and stuff are on shelves. We used to go there on primary school trips. Like and I do find that a lot actually. That like when I when I tell people, so a friend of mine grew up in Manchester and uh and we were talking about Quarry Bank Mill, which is an old um a kind of a working like, you know, mill um that's still there that you can go and see what life would have been like if you were a mill worker. And she's like, oh, yeah, we used to go on primary school trips there. And uh, that's how most people engage with that, that was, isn't it? That was mostly old hall was that for me. Yeah. Um, another one. Let's go with St. Michael's Mount, which is in Cornwall. It's one I've visited a few times. And I think it's one of my favorite National Trust properties because uh, this is something so quaint about it. It's its its own little island that has a causeway, which is not accessible at high tide, but on low tide, you can walk across it. But this causeway is just this like old cobbled, like, what do you call it? Cobbled brick pathway, which has been hand built. And, and locals and volunteers spend some time in the winter when, like, when it's like a super low tide, rebuilding bits of it. And you get to walk across it. Some people, when the tide comes back up again, try and challenge and waddle out in low water. There's a point when it becomes too deep that then you get a boat across. Um, I have even paddle boarded across from, from mainland to the island and parked in their quay. On that same day, I witnessed someone swim across there. Um, there's a great cafe. I didn't have a scone, but I had an ice cream. I remember that very fondly. But I also like it because I know you've been here as well, but I love its comparison on the French side, which is Mont Saint-Michel which is in Brittany, which I once joked with an ex-partner of mine when we were there and said that it was just the same thing we had in England, but from the French side, which is not because clearly there's a big ocean in the way. Uh, the French version is like an American version of, of our uh, St. Michael's Mount. It's much bigger, it's much grander, um, and there's also more shops there, uh, which I found a bit distasteful. 
Um, they've also built, and this is the French way, they've built a, a road that traverses across from the mainland, which is permanently there. So even at low tide, uh, even at high tide, you can access it. And so you can access this thing 24-7. It loses that kind of, it loses its story about this, this island being cut off by high tide, which is what I think is so important about our St. Michael's Mount, which has kept that part of its history. What was your experience there? I love that you're so passionate about this. Yeah, I I famously amongst my friends wrote an essay for my GCSEs about Mont Saint-Michel thinking it was the same thing as Mount as Michael's Mount. <laughs> I researched the whole subject and still didn't didn't work out that they were two completely this is, this separate This was without things. visiting, right. Yeah. I hadn't ever visited either of them. Yeah. But when you're researching something, you really do need to know what you're talking about. And I, I did not get a good mark on that GCSE paper. No. Um, but yeah, so many people must get confused, right? They are so similar with the same sort of name, but you're right. They're not the same thing. Um, although I like your idea that they, they were the same thing, but you're just coming at them from different angles. That's really funny. Um, you're right about the shops. I'd never thought about that. It's a lovely place. And I think I've read that actually Mont Saint-Michel, they have tried to make it more remote again. They've had to kind of take away that sense of, at least have a train that went across there and all sorts, didn't they? So they've got rid of that. Yeah, Mont Saint, um, Mount, uh, St. Michael's Mount in, in, the, in Cornwall still has a re- sense of remoteness. Pete and I walked across. It's like the Yellow Brick Road yes. in, uh, in the Wizard of Oz. You go across, you get there, you spend a couple of hours, then you look down from the battlements and it's just sea so we had to get a boat back so it's it's really kids love it right i mean it's just so exciting to think that where you once walked it's now sea so you can't you can't walk there anymore didn't see anyone swimming it though that's a new one so yeah i love it there yeah, i mean if you're a confident swimmer it's not too far and no, usually it's not. that bay area around um is it horizon is it called yeah place? that's right yeah is is on a calm day is a super nice place to swim and paddleboard and yeah but that's another one where the family gave it to the National Trust, but they've got a thousand year lease. I think they're there forever, really. Um, and they're still involved. So it has, it does have a sense of the family that sort of owned it for a very long time are still there, which mm. I think is nice in, in mm. that in that context. It's a lovely place. And it's one of the National Trust's most visited properties, which is amazing to think how, you know, how extreme it is at the very edge of Cornwall, right, you know. Yeah. It's, um, it is very iconic, isn't it? You can see it from all along the coastline and even from up in the Cornish Hills and looking down on it. And the fact that there's buildings that are built on top of this that make the, the island itself even grander. Yeah. It is. It's really, and it's so, I mean, the blog post about that, I can't think of all the stories now, but there's so many great stories to do with it. I mean, it's just full of, full of, yeah, full of little tidbits of history. And the guy who said he was one of the princes in a tower was there at one point. It's just this, yeah, it's a fantastic place. I'm going to close with the last final one, Kinver Edge and Rock Houses. Uh, Kimber Edge is another thing that's fairly close to me. I didn't visit it too much for as a kid, but I knew of it. Um, and then recently, in recent times, I've I've parked there to go running around the actual Kimber Edge itself, which is this huge clump of rock. Lovely trails there, lovely place to get outdoors. But built into the rock are the rock houses. Um, well, I don't know too much about them, but I know there's a cafe there. I've always I've only ever been there at times when it's not open. Tell me about Kimber Edge. Oh my God, where do you even start with Kimber Edge? If someone described to you like a piece of rock that looks like it's from a spaghetti western, right? So if you imagine like the good, the bad and the ugly or something like that, and one of those really tall sandstony rocks that seems to be like, you know, built up with loads of different levels and then there's like nothing there. But then you've got this like, like little twee midsummer m- murders style like front door stuck on the front of one of these rocks it's the weirdest thing in the world it's like a rock where people discovered it was easy to burrow them out so people would live in these rocks in the middle of the west midlands it's just completely mind blowing and people had had kind of burrowed out more and more of the rock as their families grew and they lived there and they were working in factories nearby and things like that so People were living there till the 60s, I think. I believe there was one old woman that was there till very late and it was completely, you know, not not habitable at the end, you know, because there was no sanitation or anything. Um, and in the end, they had to move them out. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm describing it. And even though I've seen it with my own eyes, I still can't believe what I saw, if that makes sense. Like there's roses over the door of this like rock, this carving into the rock. So really amazing. Um, 
And I was surprised to get a scone there. I thought I'd get a rock bun. I was like, I bet they sell rock buns. I bet like, you know, they won't have a scone. And they did have a scone and it was a five star scone. So um, it was, it was really, yeah, Kinver Edge just, I think you have got the weirdest National Trust property. That is the weirdest one. That is the one where you come away going. You know what, actually, yeah, because quite commonly you can see, oh, this grand house that was built, you know, hundreds of years ago. Yes, a lot of them, they're all different in their own right, but they're still these big houses full of wealth, right? And and things that you've either like nicked from like other countries or whatever. But a, a, a house that's carved into the rock, can't think of anywhere else, certainly in the UK where I can see that. Yeah, and it's not just a, it's not just a, you know, I'm probably describing it as if it's some sort of like tomb or something. It's not. They're rooms. They're like rooms where the wall has been painted white, but it's still just rock. And there's like a little table in the kitchen and it's just so strange. And then, like I said, these kind of, these little kind of, um, you know, roses over the doors where you just think this is just, my mind is not able to take this in. Um, yeah, you got to go. Definitely one to see. And I hope I inspire more people to go out and and go to Kimber or even Whittick Manor. Um, in the if they're in the Midlands. Uh Sarah, I've 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 much enjoyed the conversation and you just have so many stories. I think we could be talking all day. If I could list every single one of the you just are so passionate about each and every property that even though you weren't meant to be a national trust. Uh, advocate you have become one and you are the, the the best fitting person for that role so i am honored that you're you're here and i'm sharing the table with you and that you're part of great british adventures that's really kind of you tom and thank you for inviting me like great british adventures i, I knew i fit that brief i knew that i had had a great british adventure that's for sure um i just hope that it inspires other people you know to go out and do interesting projects um, whether it's just something for you yourself, like I did, or something grander for other people, I think there's so much um, to be done. And I love the project you're doing. I think it's great to gather these stories together and inspire others. So thank you. Thank you.